Hello everyone. I hope you had a good break over the reading week and had the time to catch up with the previous lectures. I know some of you are elsewhere in the world and I tell you one thing. You probably didn't miss much of Toronto's weather because we got a lot of snow last week. In terms of the course progress, um, from this session and on, I'll start a whole new chapter, which is uh, numerical methods. And in this lecture, I'll give you an introduction to numerical methods. In terms of our course navigation chart, if you remember, when we got to the nonlinear ODEs, I explained that to solve this type of equations, we need to use numerical methods. But something I have to um, explain here is that although we use numerical methods often for nonlinear ODEs, it doesn't mean that we cannot use them to solve linear ODEs. In fact, numerical methods can be used to solve linear and nonlinear ODEs or even algebraic equation. The only catch is that if we can find an analytical solution for an algebraic equation or even for a linear ODE, we prefer to use the analytical solution because of some reason. Firstly, that the analytical solution gives us the exact uh, solution whereas numerical methods give us an approximation of the solution and secondly analytical solutions are often fast tracked compared to the numerical methods because for numerical methods there is a lot of computation involved so let's see why we use numerical methods for many engineering problems we cannot obtain analytical solutions and that's why we use numerical methods which yield an approximation of the solution. So it's not an exact solution, but an approximation of the solution. To give you an example, let's look at our search tank that we studied in lecture six. If you remember in lecture six, we explained that if we have a valve at the outlet of the search tank, and if we use a proper auxiliary equation that relates the flow out of the valve to the square root of elevation of liquid within the tank, we obtain a nonlinear equation for the system, which cannot be solved analytically. So if I simplify this equation, it's basically a function on the left hand side of the equation, which is a function of h. And we have to find a solution that makes this function equal to zero. So if we could have found an analytical solution, that's why I call it H sub T or true solution, it would have made the equation equal to zero exactly. But because we are using numerical methods, the approximation, and that's why I call it H sub A, just makes the equation almost equal to zero, and that's why it's an approximation. So before we start with numerical methods and basically going to the details, I wanted to show you an ultimate application of how numerical methods are being used in engineering these days. And I have to emphasize that this is more advanced than the scope of this uh, course, but it gives you some idea of how numerical methods are uh, basically implemented to engineering. So this video to the left shows a spray of water which seems to be very simple um, in principle but in theory this is very complicated physics and for the same reason it's often required to do simulation of the water spray when we are basically interested in finding more in more of its physics so this video shows a high speed imaging of the water spray and the result is a image like this that gives you some understanding of the spray shape and formation of uh, basically ligaments and breakup of the uh, liquid as it emerges from the nozzle but what we want is to simulate or model this water spray so that we can study it in more detail. 
and for that i will take a very similar approach as we uh, use in this course so i'll define a control volume that encompasses the region that i want to model in this case it is the spray and then i start driving the governing equations in this case we start with the conservation of mass if you look at it, it might be a little bit different from what we studied in this course, but don't worry about it. These are just um, for your information. You don't need to know exactly how these equations are derived, but it, I tell you, it's a very similar concept as we went through. We have the conservation of momentum and then we have turbulence equation. And if you look at these equations, these are a set of partial differential equations which are quite nonlinear and also coupled so there is no way we can solve these equations analytically and as it appears we have to use numerical methods so without further details i'll just tell you that we can solve these equations using numerical methods and we can use some of the available software packages that use numerical methods to solve fluid flow problems and then we can get an outcome like this so the video to the left is an experimental video of the spray and the one to the right is the animation which is the outcome of numerical simulation of the spray and you can see they are in a very good agreement which means that we don't necessarily need to do experiment to study the water spray we can use numerical simulation and modeling and then with that we can obtain much more insight into this problem again you can look at this as an example to motivate you or inspire you of how numerical methods can be used in engineering application well we started with a very complicated application but to learn the concept i'll start with a very simple example let's say we want to solve the equation of this form fx is equal to zero or in other words we want to find the roots of this equation if fx is a simple function like a second order polynomial then the equation becomes a quadratic equation and we can solve it analytically using the quadratic formula but if fx is more complicated let's say this polynomial then we don't really have an analytical solution for it and we have to go after numerical methods there are two types of numerical methods for root finding the first category is bracketing methods which require two initial guesses and I explain this shortly. The second category is open methods which require only one initial guess. In this lecture we will learn one of the bracketing methods which is called bisection method and I thought the easiest way to learn this method is through an example. So for that I will open Excel and I will start solving this equation numerically using bisection method. Okay, so the problem description is find a root for this equation in the range of x between 0 and 5. So normally the first step that I take is to graph this polynomial. And for that, I just evaluate it at some values of x. Let's say I start from 0 and at intervals of 1, I just evaluate the function. So for those of you who are not very familiar with Excel, I just have to explain that in Excel, you can select any cell, double click on it, and then type in equal sign, and then put in a formula either in here or in the formula bar. In this case, our formula is the polynomial that we have here, and it starts with x to the power of five, but we wanna evaluate it at x equal to zero. So instead of typing zero to the power of five, I just click on this cell, and then I type in to the power of five, then minus three times x to the power of four, then minus four times x to the power of 3 then minus 12 times x to the power of 2 
plus 4 times x plus 12 and then you hit enter and basically it evaluates your function at x equal to 0 the next trick is you hover your mouse over this cell to the very right bottom corner and then you see that the sign turns into a cross then you left click and hold it and start dragging this cell down so what it does it basically it applies the same formula to the uh, next cells and evaluate the function at 1 2 3 4 and 5 which are these values now we want to graph this function so what i do is i select x column and i also select fx column at the same time then i go to insert select a proper type of uh, chart which in this case i use a, a scatter with a straight line i can also use a scatter with a smooth line okay let's go with this and you can see that our function start with a positive value then around x equal to one it crosses the horizontal axis so we have one root around one and then it becomes negative again and between four and five it turns upward and it crosses the horizontal axis one more time so there is another root in here and then it continues upward so the question asks us to find only one root so for simplicity let's say we want to find this root which is between four and five so the first conclusion that uh, we can make at this point is if the function has a root at a certain point the values of the function before and after that root have different signs for example in here the function is negative before the root and is positive after the root and this is a very important fact because in bisection method we have to choose a bracket that contains the root but at the lower and upper limit of the bracket the function should have different signs let's say for the argument's sake we want to find this root which is between four and five so if we start with a bracket from 4 to 5 that would be ideal because we know at 4 function is negative and at 5 fx is positive so we know that at the lower and upper limits of the bracket the sign of function changes so let me create a table in here and then i'll explain the steps that are involved in the iterative method of bisection So the first bracket that we have is from 4 to 5 and I put them just far away from each other so I have enough space between the two to do my uh, iterative steps. And maybe I just use a color to show the bracket that uh, we have in each iteration. So this is technically iteration 0 or our uh, initial guesses and if you remember we said for the bracketing methods we need two initial guesses and now i think you have the understanding of why because we have to define a bracket and for that we need a lower limit and an upper limit next we have to evaluate the function at the lower and upper limits so technically I, ha I just have to write down the equation in this cell again but I can also copy it from here so I've done that you can see that uh, the value of function at 4 is minus 164 so I can increase the number of decimal places so we can see the solution up to maybe two decimal places here is exactly 164 then i have to evaluate the function at five all i do is i just copy this uh, and paste it here and you can see the value of function at x equal to five is 482 
next we have to divide this bracket to half so for that i choose a cell which is almost in the middle of this bracket and type in lower plus upper limit divided by 2 which is 4.5 and this is iteration number 1 so at this point we evaluate the function at 4.5 again i copy this cell and paste here it's a positive value next we have to decide that which half we want to keep and which half we want to discard so the main condition we had was you keep the bracket that the function changes sign from its lower to upper limit so let's have a look here from 4 to 4.5 the function changes sign but from 4.5 to 5 the sign doesn't change so we will just discard this part and we keep the bracket that is from 4 to 4.5 again we continue the iteration so this is iteration number 2 and we find the midpoint of this range which is again this value plus this value divided by 2 and we evaluate the function at 4.25 and we see that it's a negative value so this time we discard this half and we keep this bracket because we know that the function changes sign over this interval so the third iteration will be at the midpoint of this bracket which is four point um, three seven five and the value of the function is a negative value so again we discard this half and we keep this half so now i just move um, this row a little bit lower to open up some space so iteration number four will be at the midpoint of this new bracket which is This value and then if I evaluate the function it will be a positive value so this time we discard this half and we keep this half so as you can see by doing these iterations we are narrowing down the bracket and we are getting closer and closer to the real or true value of the root but how far we should continue these iterations and where should we stop that is the concept that i'm gonna cover in the next few slides so we wanted to solve the equation of fx is equal to zero and we know that if we could solve this analytically we would have obtained a true solution for the equation and that's why i call it x sub t which if we plug it into the function it gives us an exact value of zero but because it's hard to find analytical solution we use numerical methods and they give us numerical approximation that's why i call it x sub a and when you put numerical approximation into the equation it doesn't give you uh, the exact zero it gives you something that is almost zero so we define the true error as the difference between the true solution and the approximation and we use absolute because we don't care about the sign of the error as much we care about its magnitude now let's give an example i want to measure the length of a bridge and the length of a pencil to measure the length of a bridge i use a laser measuring device and for the pencil i use a simple measuring tape and i know 
up front that the length of the bridge is exactly one kilometer or one million millimeter then I use the device and I um, and my reading is one million and one millimeter so based on this definition the true error is the difference between the true length and the approximation of the length which is one millimeter in the same fashion the length of the pencil i know that the true length is 10 centimeter or 100 millimeter but i use the measuring tape and i read 101 millimeter so if i calculate the true error again the true error is one millimeter as you can see we calculated the true errors for these two cases and they happen to be exactly the same one millimeter versus one millimeter but you know it's it doesn't feel really right to use true error because here we have one millimeter error in one million millimeter whereas in this case we have one millimeter error in 100 millimeter so there is something missing and that's the new definition which is true relative error and is defined as epsilon t which is the difference between the true value and the approximation divided by the true value and we often present this in terms of percentage so let's use this expression instead if i go back to the previous examples for the case of the bridge the true percent relative error is one over 1 million and in terms of percentage is one ten thousandth percent and in case of the pencil is one millimeter over 100 millimeter which is one percent as you can see even though the true errors of the two cases were the same the relative errors of the two cases are quite different this one is much larger error compared to this now let's see if we can use the same definition of error for numerical methods the answer is it depends for numerical methods the true value or the true solution will be known only when we deal with functions that can be solved analytically or in other words simple systems whereas in real world applications we usually don't know the answer so we don't know the true answer because if we knew the true answer we wouldn't even bother solving the equation numerically so let's assume that we don't know the true answer and we try to approximate the true answer using numerical approximation in this case we have to redefine the error and the way we redefine the error is somehow hidden in the procedure of numerical methods in numerical methods we start with an initial guess in here i use xa which stands for approximation and the superscript denotes the level of iteration or the iteration number so zero means this is our initial guess so we haven't even started the iteration and then using this initial guess we go through the first iteration and we obtain a new approximation of the solution which is xa superscript one then we continue the iteration through the second iteration and so on until we reach to the nth iteration and the final or current approximation at this level is xa superscript n and the previous approximation is xa at level n minus 1 so we try to redefine the error based on approximations at each iteration let's say in true error et was the difference between the true solution and the approximation in the numerical methods we define approximate error or ea which is the difference between the current approximation and the previous approximation 
So in, somehow in analogy, if we assume that the current approximation is the closest approximation to the true value, so we can replace the true value with the current approximation, and then we can replace the approximation with the previous approximation. So we have this definition for approximate error. And again, in the same way that we define true percent relative error or epsilon t as xt minus xa divided by xt in percentage, we define the approximate percent relative error, which is the current approximation minus the previous approximation. So whatever is our most current approximation minus the previous approximation divided by the current approximation which is this guy and this is completely in analogy with the, this expression so in this way we can calculate the relative error for a numerical method and then as you can see the relative error changes as we go through the iteration and technically then the relative error has to decrease as we go into next iteration and next iteration. So we have to see that the relative error is decreasing. But at which point do we say that, okay, this is enough. We have reached enough accuracy that we can claim that we found the solution. That is the next concept, which is called convergence criterion. Sometimes it's called a stopping criterion. And that is basically we define a pre-specified tolerance in terms of percentage. So let's say it's 0.1%. And then we start the numerical iteration and calculate the approximate relative error. And then at each iteration, we compare it with this pre-specified tolerance. And as soon as the approximate relative error becomes smaller than the pre-specified tolerance, we say that we have reached convergence and we stop the iteration. Just an important note in here, make sure that always use the absolute value of relative error. So I came back to our Excel sheet and created this part which is for error calculation. So I just copied and pasted the definition for approximate error and approximate percent relative error to here. And then I created this table so that we can calculate different errors for each iteration. For iteration number one, the approximate error is the difference between the current approximation minus the previous approximation or in this case the difference between the approximation at iteration number one minus approximation at iteration zero that was 4.5 minus 4 so i just calculate that as absolute of 4.5 which is the approximation at iteration number one minus approximation at iteration number zero which is 0.5 and the relative error is this value divided by approximation at iteration number one which is this value divided by 4.5 and if I convert it to percentage format it is 11% then at iteration number 2 the approximate error is the difference between this value and this value and again the relative error is the approximate error divided by this value 
same thing for iteration number three we have approximate error is equal to this value minus previous value and the relative error is approximate error divided by the current approximation as you can see the relative error is decreasing which is a good sign it means that our numerical method is working and we are getting closer and closer to the solution but as i said in order to decide when to stop the iteration we need to have a convergence criterion or a stopping criterion which is a tolerance to tell us our error is um, acceptable and we can declare that we reached the approximated solution so let's say in this case the convergence criterion or the pre-specified tolerance is one percent so it means that as soon as the relative error is less than one percent we can stop the iteration so let's see if we've done enough iteration so we went up to iteration number four so i have to calculate the relative error for this iteration which is one percent but we don't know if this is 0.9 or 1.1 so the best way is if i increase the number of decimal places and as you can see this is actually 1.4 so we haven't done enough iteration so we have to continue the iteration and for that let me just open up the space here again so iteration number five again i pick the midpoint of this uh, range which is this value plus this value divided by two and i calculate the function at this number which is minus 15.47 so between the top half and the bottom half i have to keep the bottom half because the sign of the function changes and discard the top half and now iteration number five the error is absolute of this value minus this value and the relative error is Point seven percent which is smaller than our convergence criteria so we can say that after five iterations the solution has converged <coughs> and we can declare this value as the approximate solution the only problem is we cannot say that we have the solution up to four decimal places because the accuracy is one percent and i'll uh, get back to this point in the next lectures maybe for now it's best that i just change the accuracy of this column to two decimal places so we can say that The root is 4.4 plus or minus the tolerance, which is in this case 1%. And this is an approximation of the root of this equation in the range of 4 to 5. The steps that are involved in bisection method are listed here. These are 
basically the same steps that we followed in our example they start with step one which is selecting the first bracket in step two we evaluate the function at the midpoint of the bracket and in step three there are multiple conditions that will be checked and depending on which condition is satisfied we choose one half of the bracket and the other half will be discarded and also we continue the iteration by going back to step two in steps four and five we check the convergence criteria if relative error is smaller than the pre-specified tolerance we stop the calculation and we say that the convergence is reached if you are developing a code for bisection method you can follow these steps in your code with this we can conclude the session